space, but also reimagine a more resilient future. This may be the most challenging year the world has seen in my lifetime. The pandemic, the war in the Ukraine, and the humanitarian emergencies in Afghanistan and elsewhere have caused millions of deaths and plunged hundreds of millions into hunger and poverty. Women and girls are bearing the brunt of this suffering. The overlapping catastrophes have threatened their health, their education, their livelihoods, and their lives. There is a better way. When countries put women at the center of everything they do, everyone benefits. But what does it look like to put women at the center? I have four recommendations. First, focus on primary health systems, which can provide most of the care women and children need as long as they're well-funded. Second, harness agriculture for growth. By doubling donor investment in agriculture, we can help 545 million smallholder farmers adapt to climate change, double their incomes, and strengthen economies. Third, make digital payments the default. Knock down the barriers that keep women and other marginalized groups from participating in the modern economy. Fourth, mobilize funding for developing countries. This includes the International Monetary Fund's special drawing rights, official development assistance, and financing from multilateral development banks. If the world continues to give less assistance when countries need it the most, the vulnerable will keep suffering. I was in Paris one year ago to attend the Generation Equality Forum, where an incredible 40 billion was committed to making women's lives better everywhere. Progress for women and girls, and for everyone, depends on deepening these commitments. We have a choice. We can try to address each crisis as it comes without solving the underlying inequalities that cause them, or we can change. We can make our world the world we all want to live in. Thank you. Voilà, c'est un message qui doit euh, inspirer les.
Bonjour. Good morning, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, second day in these rencontres. Dex are. Uh, so our general topic is about achieving uh, transformations, uh, and our topic uh, this morning that has uh, made you come in very large numbers indeed is uh, about um, local governance. Uh, so uh, when we talk about territories in uh, French, that can seem a bit dry, uh, but uh, we, of course, are thinking of the Yellow Vests movement, for example, and other crises, and that Yellow Vest movement uh, could uh, reappear. And when we look at the last four uh, elections uh, in 2022, uh, the uh, topics of governance and governing over uh, divides and polarization, this is uh, perhaps more topical than ever, and maybe we should work at a culture of compromise in France and maybe looking at the private sector because there are three, uh, uh, we have representatives from three different companies who will be able to bear testimony um, to how governance, how dialogue between the center and the periphery, uh, to tell us about local solutions, tell us about the solutions they've devised to crisis. So these are a few examples of what we're going to tackle with our guests. Chloé Morin, invited by uh, the Cercle des Économistes. She's uh, published a number of uh, books uh, uh, and she works for L'Express uh, weekly uh, magazine and also works for the Jean Jaurès Foundation. So she'll probably um, tell us about this topic even more eloquently than I have. And then we are going to um, listen to Sabrina Soussan, the new uh, uh, managing director of the new uh, Suez. So we'll t talk about water governance in uh, and in uh, this uh, part of the country that suffers from drought. This will be really interesting. Thierry Mallet is uh, the managing director of Transdev. So we'll talk about mobility and local solutions that still need to be devised. And Julien Carmona. Uh, who's a banker, but uh, 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 and uh, he is actually um, he represents Crédit Mutuel Arkea, so a fairly um, local network. Um, so we should have an interesting uh, debate, and we have someone um, by uh, video link, uh, Ms. Uh, Ayar uh, from the Center of Policy Research. Thank you, Madam, for joining us, and uh, we'll listen to you in a moment. So I'll give you four minutes, Chloe. Your viewpoint, your stance on the on the topic. Okay. So this idea of a more local uh, governance, when we talk about governance or institutions, um, experts have a sparkle in their eye, but uh, uh, private citizens usually repress a yawn. So. Um, this, when we conduct surveys, and this is pretty much what I do, looking at public opinion, uh, people are not really fascinated by it. But uh, if you look at recent events, it uh, goes to show that it's really at the heart of our lives. Over the last few years, there's been an increasing um, uh, criticism of uh, institutions and of the decision-making process on a national scale, very presidential uh, regime, an imbalance between the uh, between um, the executive power and uh, legislative power, and even the distribution of power uh, between uh, in the parliament, uh, but. This criticism uh, remains the preserve of a circle of experts, even though more and more private citizens feel the limits of our model, and the crisis of the yellow faced movement is an illustration of that. Uh, uh, but then uh, came uh, the legislative elections, so our general elections in France, and that conversation on how to better share power, how to better distribute power, really was uh, the talk of the town. Um, and 
So what maybe politicians could not impose in the public conversation or in the debate in parliament was uh, imposed by private citizens. This is what makes uh, uh, these times and the period we're in uh, so interesting. There'll probably be uh, stumbling blocks and uh, false starts, but we are in a time when there's a rethinking of uh, roles and responsibilities. And um, the idea that uh, uh, power between executive and legislative powers needs to be redistributed and between a majority and opposition uh, in parliament. So there will probably be difficulties, there will be a trial and error, but uh, on a national scale, some things, something will have to give. That's my um, uh, conviction, that's my belief. So it is about uh, a, a more efficient decision-making process uh, to serve the national community, uh, and that redefinition uh, should also make it possible for us to act more efficiently. At least that's the hope. So uh, there's no reason why this should stop, uh, and it needs to be redefined on a local scale, which brings us to our topic this morning, because on a local scale, we can feel it, whether we be observers of, uh, of uh, uh, polit political life or whether we be uh, private citizens at the head of local governments or working for private companies. We need to improve the way decisions are made when it comes to transport, water management, or any sector of the economy or of politics. And stumbling blocks, hindrances, sources of inefficiency are too many. The, the challenge is quite clear. Uh, what's at stake is our capacity to face the different crises we have to weather. I'm thinking of not only the war in Ukraine, climate change, but also social inequalities, growing social inequalities. These uh, challenges make it uh, all the more pressing to rethink the way we make decisions and the way we think on a national scale, but also on a local scale. Which is why the topic of a better sharing of power is so fundamental, even though it might seem a bit technical. And I'm glad we're going to tackle it from a very concrete, hands-on perspective, listening to stakeholders that can really um, uh, put a finger on uh, uh, how decision-making processes uh, um, actually work uh, or how they should be improved. One of the central questions uh, in political decision making is uh, what is the right scale uh, for decision making process um, uh, so as to make for more effective action? Indeed, thank you very much, Chloe. Yes, of course, uh, can give Chloe a, a round of applause and you can actually give us a collective round of applause at the end, maybe. Well, maybe to specify our topic uh, this morning, uh, we talked about politics, but there is uh, but we do not have politicians here in, um, on this panel. We have practitioners, but these practitioners actually are in a constant dialogue with local decision makers, local uh, elected representatives. Let's start with you, Ms. Uh, Sabrina Sousson. You are the new uh, CEO of Suez. Uh, so uh, in terms of scope, there hasn't been major changes, but in terms of being able to act on environmental matters and uh, uh, and more specifically uh, on water uh, uh, management, you constantly liaise with uh, national and uh, local decision makers. So how do you find ways to navigate that, bearing in mind that water, it's uh, dawning on us that it's uh, water is a resource that's going to become rarer, that's going to uh, uh, be uh, uh, in shortage. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here this morning. The new uh, Suez company 
uh, maybe I can remind everybody uh, that it's 40,000 uh, employees and a leader in circular economy and green transition. Our two core businesses are water management and waste management. Since we are uh, dealing with green transition and the environment, I'm going to uh, insist on environmental governance. And I have five points I'd like to make. I'll start with uh, the supranational governance, and I'll go all the way down to the local scale. With regards to my first point, my first point is that uh, we are faced with a huge environmental challenge. Uh, that uh, we all have to rise up to. It uh, um, requires a dual solidarity, solidarity between generations, because uh, the citizens today will uh, citizens today will make decisions that will have an impact beyond their lifetime. And secondly, uh, uh, advanced country economies. Uh, uh, will have to support emerging economies, even though their growth is going to be slower. That's a second challenge we'll have to rise up to. And supranational governance is necessary in the environmental sector. For example, think of uh, UN uh, climate conventions. Unfortunately, as far as water is concerned, we do not have uh, that type of conventions. And that's a problem because water is going to be a major challenge in the near uh, future. There's going to be a, a conference in New York in 2023, a UN conference on water. There hasn't been such a conference since 1977. So I'll let you ponder that. So we really need an international body for that international governance on water. Second point I wanted to make is that international governance needs then to translate into national governance, which brings us back to our topic. We need to uh, develop a more local governance with a legislative and regulatory framework, framework that should be conducive to a change, to changes in behavior and quicker change. It's always better to illustrate with examples. So general tax on polluting activities has made it possible to make, to make it so that waste that should have gone straight to landfill uh, were to be recycled. A second example in Switzerland, uh, there's, there are regulations on micropollutants. There's a, uh, an obligation to uh, process to recycle these micropollutants so that they're not discharged in the natural environment. Which brings me to my third point. Third point I wanted to make is that we need local solutions to meet local uh, challenges. That's important as well. We need to look at local environmental challenges and how we can devise local solutions. An example that can be quite surprising in the north of France, groundwater table are uh, being depleted, more and more depleted. It's a part of uh, the country where there are lots of uh, ammunition and pollution that uh, date back to uh, the world, the two world wars, and that's a specific type of pollution that is very specific to that part of the country. So that requires local solutions. An example, as far as waste goes, uh, when it comes to recycle, you have to really tackle it uh, at the source point. And depending on the region, uh, behaviors are completely different. Uh, so you have to adapt. In Brittany, for example, and in Alsace, uh, they are really uh, the best uh, uh, in uh, France in terms of uh, behavior. So yeah, I mentioned Brittany uh, uh, completely at random. Uh, OK, but no, but it's true, More uh, all jokes aside. So you have to adapt to the specificities of local uh, 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 areas. And you have to make for more local governance, and you have to choose the right type of governance that is adapted to local context. When it comes to water management, there are delegation of public service, there are concessions. 
So it's the outsourcing of public service. We have mixed economy uh, uh, bodies. There are uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, what else? Um, well, that's pretty much it. We support our customers so as to co-build, co-construct with them and find the best governance model um, uh, that is uh, uh, really adapted to the local to local context. And public governance does not necessarily uh, imply solutions uh, to be uh, uh, implemented only by public stakeholders. It really has to be about a partnership. And my last point, uh, the last point I wanted to make is about technology. So um, what we need to do uh, requires more and more sophisticated and complex technologies, and these cannot be implemented in one local area. So complex solutions need to be developed at a more centralized uh, level and a more centralized scale to meet challenges that are at uh, uh, play. Anaerobic digestion uh, is um, in uh, 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 to recycle sludge uh, in uh, water treatment uh, on wa water treatment plants. This is highly technological. You can't uh, implement that uh, uh, in local area. Uh, I'm thinking also of uh, 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 chemical uh, substance uh, recycling. So this needs to be more centralized because it requires really sophisticated technology. So to wrap up, I would say that uh, green transitions and all the challenges we need to face require the right scale in terms of governance, be it so supranational, national or local. And it also requires um, uh, stronger collaboration between private and public stakeholders. There can't be a one-size-fits-all solution. There's no uh, silver bullet. Uh, there's no superhero. I'm not a superhero. Uh, but there can only be stakeholders that rally around these challenges. Thank you very much, Sabrina Souson. And you are on time, so I hope your uh, male uh, um, co-panelists will emulate you. So I just uh, want to pick up on what you said. We'll take questions uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, you can send them by text, by the way, or, or ask them uh, uh, orally. We uh, all wonder about drought because uh, we are here in the part of the country that suffers for drought, from drought. Will we be able to fill up our uh, pools in 10, 10 or 15 years uh, uh, from now? Or will regulations uh, allow for it? Um, or will it be a problem the uh, same way as it is in California? Well, water, uh, as I um, as I mentioned before, hasn't been at the top of the agenda. Yes, there's a lot of talk about CO2, uh, but not so much about water. Recovery plan, 100 billion, 30 billion for the environment, uh, very little, only 300,000 euros for water um, uh, related uh, questions. Uh, uh, it says that water, uh, France actually, uh, uh, um, there's a waste uh, of uh, water uh, due to leakages uh, in France that is uh, the equivalent of the of a, the yearly consumption of Belgium. Yes, and you have to factor in the fact that it takes 200 years to completely renew networks. There's also a question of reusing, recycling of water. Of course, the, big, the, the largest amount of water is used for farming, and we often use drinking water for irrigation rather than using uh, recycled water, which is what happens in Italy or Spain. Uh, uh, so 10% uh, of um, water used for farming is recycled. Uh, in France, uh, only 1% uh, is recycled. So we're lagging behind. OK, thank you very much. Second example, I mentioned the Yellow Vest movement because the question of mobility is really at the heart of
that services are organized for the metropolitan area, not taking into account all the surroundings of the metropolitan area. And I think we have to change scale, not think of metropolitan area as the only scale, but think of um, uh, the sort of catchment area. So if we think of Bordeaux, Marseille, Paris, we have to look at the surrounding 50 kilometers. So. So we have to foster a new form of public conversation, of dialogue. And uh, I'll come back to uh, the example of Germany in which Transdev uh, uh, is very present. In France, 11% of kilometers uh, are covered using public transport. In Germany, it's 19% because there are more regional trains, regional buses, which make for a better alternative to cars. So. Uh, uh, you see, if you uh, regulate even more in terms of, for example, low emission areas, you'll make for more constraints, and that's not going to work. What's going to um, uh, work is to develop an alternative to using your car. Uh, and it's actually once you're outside of the metropolitan area that the use of car goes through the roof. So we have to change scale. Um, and we'll, we can talk about waste uh, treatment. I think we have to look at that um, uh, catchment area, which is really the right scale, uh, no longer the uh, um, uh, metropolitan area. And this has to be a, a conversation uh, between metropolitan area and regions. So uh, what are the solutions you would put forward? Well, uh, regional trains uh, uh, are uh, a, uh, a solution, regional light rail, uh, but of course uh, the, uh, it takes a lot of time to uh, implement that, to develop that. Uh, in the Bordeaux uh, metropolitan area and the Aquitaine uh, 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 region, there's this, um, a line of coaches, of buses, 20 kilometers away from Bordeaux, between Créon and Bordeaux. It's a line that was actually commissioned just before COVID-19. And from day one, 1,000 people hopped on these coaches. Uh, and the, you had USB ports, Wi-Fi connection, you can sit. Um, uh, so they do not have uh, dedicated lanes yet, but we're thinking of it. And from day one, uh, uh, people uh, um, actually um, uh, realized uh, it, it was very popular because people realized that they could save on petrol. But for people to leave cars, their cars behind, have there been um, parking space, new parking space? Uh, yes, indeed, there are parking spaces so that people can park and then uh, hop on, on, on the bus. Um, uh, well, there's a big parking space uh, near the Saint Arnoux um, uh, toll uh, station, 50 kilometers away from Paris, so that they can actually take a, a, a bus that takes them to uh, Massy, which is a uh, um, where you can actually take a, a train, and you have uh, coaches, buses every five minutes, uh, and you can save even more, 270 euros. You can save every month. Well, bearing in mind the uh, price of petrol, uh, 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 this looks like the perfect solution. How can we upscale that? Well. Um, uh, Metropolitan areas and regions need to really uh, uh, get to grips with that because these services, these bus lines, uh, you know, from between Créon and Bordeaux, it only took six months to commission that. Electric buses can be electric buses. Uh, we started with diesel. Uh, but uh, actually, one diesel uh, bus uh, is, uh, uh, has uh, less impact in terms of pollution than uh, thousands and thousands of diesel-powered cars. Uh, between Avignon and Aix, between Aix and Toulon. Um, so electric uh, electric buses can uh, help cover sometimes 50 kilometers. Well, one last question. Uh, just, uh, we talk, there's a lot of talk about making public transport free because there's the question of cost of living that is, of course, very topical. Is that a good solution? Is it a bad solution to encourage people uh, uh, to live their cars uh, 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 at home? Well, as I said, 
uh, to encourage people to use public transport. Price is not actually the main factor. People use public transport because it's more convenient. There are um, uh, actually concessions and reduced prices for people who can't afford public transport. So really, what is the determinant factor is to have uh, a good uh, um, public transport offering uh, to really multiply twofold that uh, offer so that we can move to 80% of people using their cars down to 60% of people using their cars. People will go on using their cars, but the point is to have them not cover 50 kilometers while using their car, but cover 10 kilometers till they can park their car and hop on a bus. Or um, And so these buses, you have buses every five minutes uh, at uh, rush uh, peak hours uh, and um, but of course you want to be able to rely on uh, these uh, uh, buses and coaches so they have to be reliable and frequent and let me remind you that 25 percent of people in France had to decline a job offer because they knew they would not be able to commute to work so being able to uh, leave your car at home increases your freedom of uh, moving around, so we have to devise more solutions. So the, the point is really develop, developing public transport offer. It's not price that is the determining factor. Well, thank you. As you see, you know, we can talk about the topics in very practical terms. Uh, there's uh, without any political issues. So with Julien Carbona, we are now going to talk about uh, governance. Uh, well, you are a regional bank, so there's the issue of uh, financial financing uh, close companies or local companies, which is really very topical. And there's a second topic, which is uh, uh, how can we discuss again uh, with uh, the Federation? You said that yesterday you were talking about with the Federation of uh, Credit Mutuel, the position of uh, Arkea, because you would like to take on more uh, importance. So you're going to look at uh, governance uh, along those lines. Uh, I'll let you pick how you want to start. Well, thank you for inviting me. Well, first I'll start with the general terms and then go over to the specific. So territorializing is a term that is difficult to uh, mouse. Let's uh, uh, replace it by another difficult uh, uh, word, which is subsidiarity. So what can be done well at uh, one level shouldn't be taken care of by the higher level. Why not? Because it would be inefficient and unfair. It would be unfair to deprive a local human community of the means of uh, uh, treating a topic uh, 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 f uh, that they can do well. This comes from the social uh, church doctrine, but uh, it's uh, uh, also something that applies. So we are a territorial and regional bank, which has its headquarters in a, a small community next to Brest, uh, in Relais de Caerion. So we're very well implanted in in Rennes, in uh, uh, Brest and Bordeaux, because uh, we're also part of the Girondine uh, uh, region, and uh, we're also Girondin in uh, the uh, uh, political t uh, term. And we have 11,000 uh, uh, people working for us, including 10,000 who are outside the region around Paris. So we might feel maybe we're the last uh, of the Mohicans uh, or we are uh, precursors. Well, you feel like the, the last uh, Gaulois village. Uh, yes, but we have the biggest growth of all French banks and uh, including for employment uh, because uh, we increased uh, our headcount by 20% over the past few years when other banks were decreasing their headcount by uh, seven years. Um, so this may due, be due to the fact that we're a local bank, uh, but uh, that is innovating. So we're part of a situation which we all know, which is that of a country that is uh, hugely centralized. Everything is centralized in terms of law, 
legal uh, centralization in terms of competencies. There's been decentralizing laws that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, led to more complexity because uh, the state does not uh, let go of its prerogatives, and there's even more levels now, and no level can act on its own. When we talk about de economic development, we first turn to the regions, Bretagne, Nouvelle-Aquitaine, Pays de la Loire, and then to the metropolis when they have the competencies. But uh, the regions may be political actors, but they are dwarfs at financial level. They haven't got uh, the uh, right uh, levels, uh, li uh, the right financial means like uh, the lenders or the uh, Spanish regions, for example. So France is still hugely centralized, and as soon as something can uh, change, we start with the principle of uh, uh, territoriality and um, central principles of the Republic. I remember Edith Cresson, who was unfairly criticized because she was the only one who delocated or deconcentrated about 20 uh, public organizations, including uh, ENA, uh, the higher school of education. And it's a pity she was criticized for this. There's another example of the delocalization of Yves Remer, who used to be, which used to be in ici les moulineaux and is now in Brest, which is close to the sea, which is, seems perfectly logical. But it took 15 years before it was announced and it was implemented. And now everybody is happy because the researchers, as they are oceanographers, are happy to be close to the sea. But who opposed it? Well, uh, the people who said we have to be in Paris because it's a good thing to be close to the Ministry of the Sea. Well, things changed with the COVID crisis, really. You have over 90 percent of uh, uh, big companies are located in Paris, except for Michelin in Clermont, Lactalis uh, in Laval, or uh, uh, Yves Rocher in Morbihan. 17,000 people uh, throughout the world, or we're in Brest, etc. So things are moving. The state, uh, the structure is not moving, but there seems to be a movement that comes from the, the upwards, really. Uh, it comes from companies because you have the appearance of local champions or big national companies uh, get organized and uh, want to be re-territorialized. And you have great examples of uh, uh, companies or uh, like us uh, who think it's in the interest of their staff and citizens. And there's uh, citizens who are starting to do that, to decentralize themselves because the idea is not to have a big metropolis in the middle of a desert. Uh, if the idea is uh, to have to Toulouse in the middle of the desert or Bordeaux in the middle of a desert, it wouldn't be the right thing. So issues are issues of mobility, and that might lead to a new territorial planning. I don't think things will come from the top because the state doesn't want to do it and may no longer have uh, the ability to do so. You were part of a, uh, a ministry at a uh, long time ago, yes. And uh, uh, you have to be uh, uh, clear about that. But uh, planning coming from uh, 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 coming upwards uh, would be very interesting. Three words about our bank model. We are a mutualist and cooperative bank. What does it mean? It means that we have no stakeholder, uh, shareholders. We are representative of our uh, the members of our society, and they elect uh, our their uh, elect authorities. Uh, have been elected by 300 local uh, offices, and uh, all are they. You have uh, professional people. You have farmers. Uh, people with different jobs. This is a model of governance uh, which might have sent you smiling a few years ago, but which is extremely modern. Obviously, like for some mutual companies, there have been uh, some drifting. But if you're very careful not to have this drifting, it's very important for you to be anchored in the territory and the sh stakeholders. 
And uh, thanks to this, uh, obviously, we defined a raison d'etre. We became a society with a mission two months ago with uh, objectives that we feel are uh, very important. What uh, many companies do, uh, they, they say they, we adopt objectives and uh, we um, commit to them and uh, report about them. And uh, so this uh, is a way of contributing to the territorial vitality. This is what we try to do. We, uh, we're on our way. We are not uh, very popular with the technical structure of Paris, uh, for example, to which I used to belong, it's true. And what about the story of Crédit Mutuel Arkea? It's a project of uh, freedom, autonomy, and subsidiarity. We are legally part of a group, which is Crédit Mutuel, which was highly decentralized uh, originally, and this is why it's so strong. And it's not so decentralized now. Why? Because of consolidation. And now you no longer have one uh, Crédit Mutuel, but two. We have us, uh, the small one and the group uh, which was born in uh, Strasbourg. It's called now uh, Crédit Mutuel Alliance Fédérale ou CIC. But uh, uh, it's difficult to have a balanced uh, governance. So there are two solutions, either the one that was uh, talked about in 2018. Uh, it can't continue working like that. We have to be independent. We go out there. So, uh, uh, it would be great, but we know that uh, all our authorities are not for it, but if it's the only solution, we'll opt for it. Or we have to find a system which is based on subsidiarity. As in Europe, uh, you have a collective project. Some decisions were, uh, and decisions are made unanimously. And if it works, it would be a great solution. So if I can... Well, thank you for this great presentation. So if I can sum summarize, you tried to get a divorce uh, with a consent. Yes, or a body separation. Well, thank you for keeping to the time that was allotted to you. I tried to balance it. Now we have uh, Mrs. Yamini Eya. She's not with us today, but can we be connected to India, please? Hello, madam. Seven seven minutes to explain and uh, you have the the, the, the the place is yours thank you uh, it's been a privilege for me to be a part of this discussion and i'm deeply sorry that i'm not able to be there in person uh, both to learn from uh, the exchange in person as well as to enjoy the beauty uh, of, of, uh, of, the, of the countryside of France. Hopefully, uh, on another occasion, I'll have the chance to, to be there. I've been listening to this discussion uh, with great interest, uh, coming from it from the perspective of uh, my home country, India, from where I speak today. Um, and I thought it would be useful for me to talk a little bit about India's experience with territorialization or local governance. Um, and why it matters uh, for us as a country uh, to uh, privilege the importance of uh, territorial governance or local governance um, as, as a lesson perhaps uh, for other countries as they are thinking about precisely these challenges. And I admit two remarks here. First uh, and foremost, um, India, as many of you uh, may know, is a deeply diverse country. Uh, some have often said that India is multi many states, many ethnicities, many regions, many religions coming together to hold together in the form of uh, a nation state. Um, the ca one characterization has been of India as a state nation rather than a nation state. And I think that our constitutional recognition of the importance of local government or federalism uh, is the word I would use, uh, has uh, been core to what has made this country, which is so deeply diverse um, and very different in some senses, hold together and stay together in a, as a united nation. 
Um, and, and, and the reason I say this is because in diversity, there are inevitably, uh, um, uh, a, a democracy even inevitably creates the spaces uh, and the demands for deeper representation uh, and deeper presence within the democratic structure. Federalism allows for that kind of accommodation. It allows and enables uh, ethnicities, religions, languages uh, to find their representation within the broader makeup of the nation state. In India, for instance, in the late 1950s, we had a lot of representational anxiety around the linguistic question. How do different languages, which are linked to different cultures, different ethnicities, different regions, uh, find themselves represented in the democratic project that India had embarked on in 1947 when we became independent. The ability of the federal principle to accommodate for these anxieties resulted in a redrawing of state boundaries uh, and I think is at the heart of what makes for the diversity of India stay together. Had we not worked towards a federal architecture uh, that recognized the importance of representational needs of this diversity, perhaps the ability to hold together in a democratic fashion may well have been far, far more constrained. There is, of course, an irony in this, uh, which is also worth highlighting, that in the Indian context, the ability of the nation state to accommodate uh, for these representational needs for deeper localization has required a much stronger national government compared to many other federal countries across the globe. Uh, in that the national government holds the power constitutionally to redraw boundaries of states, um, uh, which is how we were able to respond to these claims of, uh, of, of representational demand uh, from different parts of the country. What it does do though, and it's something for us to think about as we work towards the discourse on deeper localization and better representation, um, is that a strong center uh, often gets vulnerable to deeper centralization even in a federal context. Um, and if you look at the current political challenges that India uh, is confronting today, uh, the strong powers allocated to the center are in fact resulting in a deeper centralization, which is the antithesis of uh, what has made India Indian democracy survive effectively. So I think the importance of localization, of local governments, of territorialization of, of, of governance rests in the ability of democracy to be able to respond to representational needs of people across different uh, cultures, ethnicities, diversities, and it enables for a more fuller democracy and a more fuller representation. The second quick point I wanted to make in my remaining time was uh, building on what the previous speaker had said on the importance of the principle of subsidiarity. What must be done at a particular level of government, the local level of government, the middle level of government, the national level of government, should only be done by that level of government and no other. Again, India is a really important case study of how despite a federal system, we get it often very wrong uh, and as a consequence, uh, fail to provide uh, high quality public services at the level at which they are supposed to be provided. Um, often, it is the national government or the sub-national government that is making decisions on functions like water, waste management that we spoke about uh, earlier in this session, the delivery of education, the delivery of poor public health services for local governments. And the reason that becomes problematic is because the, 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 there is no one size fit all in a large context. The needs of healthcare uh, in um, in one, in the eastern part of the country are very different to the needs of healthcare in the northern part of the country or the southern part of the country. In the following way, our demographics look very different. So some parts of northern India are much younger in terms of their populations relative to some parts of southern India. But when the central government is designing health policies and health delivery systems, they can't accommodate for these differences. So Southern India needs to deal with communicable diseases or non-communicable diseases like heart, uh, and, uh, cardiac issues, diabetes and so on. Whereas Northern India is still dealing with communicable diseases. They require very different policies and very different approaches. COVID-19 highlighted how important that this is in, a, uh, in, in India. Uh, when, uh, 
we, we, we experienced this very, very difficult health challenge, it turned out that those parts of India that had stronger local governments, where health was being implemented uh, through, provided through the local government, we in fact had a much better and much stronger response to the health challenges that COVID presented us than those parts of the country that didn't have so much robust subsidiarity in how they handle health policy. So COVID was a very good example of why subsidiarity should be at the heart of how we think about the challenge of localizing of local governance or territorialization of governance. A, a second area of urgency which has come up consistently in the course of this conversation today yani, yani, is the you challenge have, you of have, climate to, to conclude, and the importance of local governments in responding to that challenge of climate. Water, environmental protection, um, uh, waste management, all of these issues which are the heart, pollution, all of these issues which are at the heart of responding to the challenge of climate require a very localized response, both because it requires deep shifts in behavior, which can only be achieved through a closer interaction between local governance uh, and the people, but also because these are genuinely local services which on the basis of the principles of subsidiarity are best delivered at the local level. But it throws up one last challenge for the question of local governance, which I think we need to debate uh, in, in, in platforms like this, which is that as the needs of governance become more local, and as we move towards a more localized governance structure, the needs for intergovernmental coordination and cooperation also become quite significant. In addressing the challenge of climate, there are different roles that government policy at the federal level have to play, that the subnational governments have to play, and that the local Merci governments beaucoup. have to play. Um, and each of these Merci require deep bien coordination bien. because a challenge like climate requires a whole Therefore, uh, we need to be thinking more harder about how the principle of subsidiarity translates into deeper intergovernmental coordination and what kind of institutions we need for that. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony and experience. Sorry, but we are late of time. Merci beaucoup, Yamini Eyar, pour ce témoignage. Thank you very much, Yamini, yeah, for this testimony about the, the greatest democracy in the world. We see that the issue of subsidiarity is uh, true everywhere. We have very little time to take questions from uh, the audience, but uh, uh, I'll take the ones on the text messages. Do you think uh, we should end the centra Paris centralization of power and decision making? Uh, the efficacy of our institutions could be better highlighted with uh, an, uh, a reference for assessment of uh, uh, territoriality. What about the uh, citizens' policy, politics? Uh, this is the famous uh, demand for bottom-up decisions uh, that was mentioned. Maybe the famous uh, Golwa villages that always resist uh, is sending us a message uh, all of us. Uh, let me start with you, Sabrina Soussan. How do you, uh, do you think that in a way this uh, 2002 uh, uh, year, we know that uh, things have to be different and we have to aim towards uh, efficacy, which is mainly at local level. Well, I believe that there's more and more demand for involvement, as we can see. This demand comes from citizens and companies. Uh, the staff members want to be involved more and more. We talk more and more about raison d'être. In fact, you, acquire, uh, you attract talents uh, with a raison d'être more than with a salary. And uh, this is why we need uh, this uh, involvement. Now, there's not one rule for all, one size fits all. We have uh, to see that some solutions are better locally, others uh, are better defined at central level. And what we have to do is work well together and cooperate at all levels. Thierry. Uh, well, if we look at companies today, uh, when we looked at what happened uh, with the COVID crisis, the decision-making centers, they were where uh, central, they were local, 
and uh, center, the center was really uh, synthesizing uh, what was taking place at local level. Transdev, uh, we are present in many countries and we uh, uh, carry uh, 25 million people every year. And I would say that things are organized at city level. And in fact, uh, with COVID, we in increased our decentralization with the principle of subsidiarity. Decisions are made uh, on the spot. I have no two maintenance uh, warehouses that are managed in the same way. Now, everybody gets organized they want to be. If I invent uh, a solution in Berlin, in Paris, or in Stockholm to organize the maintenance depots, usually in the field, uh, people do the reverse to show that uh, what comes from this uh, from uh, the center doesn't work. So when you have a lot of confusion, you don't know who's uh, responsible and you can't improve. So I believe that the principle of subsidiarity, making sure we're working at the right scale. If you're too small, we saw it for cities, you have to have a really the whole basin. Uh, but uh, uh, you have to invent new examples. You have to see what's being done elsewhere, not necessarily in the country. You can look elsewhere also in other countries to find the right level of subsidiarities and of responsibility. When we know who is making the decision, if you accept to take it, you can't uh, escape your responsibilities. Julien Carmona, between uh, 20 and 2020, uh, the, uh, what what changed and what do you think is more modern in uh, what's happening now which may be the best thing well thank you philip it may be difficult to uh, decode the message uh, we had in the elections if we look at uh, the number of uh, voters uh, they are not that many well maybe that's the main message uh, so that was the first thing. Uh, secondly, if we look at the conclusions uh, from the government, first of all, there's notion of planning, uh, ecological and uh, environmental planning. And I hear several things, something that is right and something is that's not as good. First thing is that you have to plan properly because for some investments, uh, they only become profitable. Uh, the return only comes after 50 years or doesn't come. And the second thing is the right planning. For example, five-year planning, you have uh, very clever people who organize that and then send it to the field saying, well, you make do with this. And the last thing is to have uh, elected authorities like Christophe Bichu or others who are high quality people and will carry the vision. But it's not all black and white. Obviously, the role, the state has a role to play to design an, uh, a nuclear program. For, for example, no one else but a strong state could do that. And there's something else that I didn't mention, which is not directly linked to the elections, but which seems important. Uh, we need uh, territorial decision making centers but you also should have uh, financial decision-making centers. You should have regional banks, regional stock exchange that have disappeared, but we could uh, come again. And without uh, being mani uh, mannequin, for example, you have uh, big uh, uh, structures uh, uh, that have uh, managed to de delocalize and deconcentrate. But if you haven't got the financial level, you don't have much power. Thank you, Julien. Chloe, one word of conclusion. Did we answer the question, should we decentralize everything in a few minutes? I don't know, but there's one thing we should, maybe we can mention briefly. It's a cultural topic. Um, well, uh, staff members ask for more power. Uh, citizens want more power. We can see that in our relation with national institutions. We see that we're all uh, uh, very much uh, attached to the notion of uh, strong uh, uh, human beings. The fact that there's no absolute majority in the parliament is also seen 
as something to be feared because we feel, okay, if only one person decides we're going to be efficient and it will go fast, but if we, uh, if the decision is uh, scattered, uh, we'll uh, be inefficient. And we're worried about uh, the fact that parliaments uh, will take uh, time uh, to pass laws, even though for many years uh, we've passed uh, uh, laws by way of emergency that are never well applied. So it's a, uh, a cultural paradox uh, to the power, and, uh, which me, uh, explains why we are not at the end of the road yet. Well, uh, thank you for this conclusion and uh, this hope, and we'll listen to Elisabeth Bonn at the beginning of the afternoon to see if uh, the message, uh, uh, if, you, if everybody got the message. Well, uh, thank you very much.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, panel about intermediary bodies. This is the uh, session number 23. Uh, and uh, to cover this topic, it is my pleasure to have with me four members of the panel. Mrs. Véronique Bédac, uh, uh, Director General of Next City. Mr. Patrick Martin, who is Delegate President of the MEDEF and uh, a CEO of a company. And Mr. Yves Verrier, former Secretary General of Force Ouvrière. He just left his functions. Uh, hello, says he. We will also have uh, via video Mr. Rainer Hoffmann, who is uh, the chairman of the German Trade Union Confederation. Hello, Mr. Hoffmann. Can you hear us? Can you hear? Lovely. <laughs> I will start with a brief introduction of the topic. What are we talking about? These famous intermediary bodies, you will see that we'll even discuss the definition of these intermediary bodies. They're considered as actors and stakeholders of an organized civil society. They would be representatives of companies, uh, trade unions, associations, political parties, commercial uh, tribunals, uh, councillor chambers, organizations of uh, public policies like uh, the uh, Economic, Social and Environmental Council or the regional ones. Uh, and corporations, uh, youth groups, uh, government organizations, media, etc. So these intermediary bodies are a kind of uh, uh, relay with civil society, which is absolutely unnecessary. As the Secretary General of CGT, uh, Laurent Berger, uh, says, uh, the intermediary bodies are there to contest a uh, relay. But when there's a conflict, they're also there to dampen uh, and, uh, uh, the situation. So. Uh, they are an intermediary between the people and the public power. Nevertheless, in a context of uh, social tensions and of successive crises, health crisis, social crisis, economic crisis, political crisis, and of uh, a mutation, a social transformation, technological evolution, technological transition, there are several questions that you can try to answer this morning. Are these intermediary bodies representative? We're thinking in particular was uh, about what we call the social uh, stakeholders or partners. They also have a role to represent the interests of some groups uh, within civil society, and uh, they are to represent them uh, in front of the state. If you look at the yellow jacket crisis, we might think that it is due to some weakness of these intermediary bodies. Are they useful? We uh, noted a massive abstention in the la last elections. What about uh, the role of the Economic, Social and Environmental uh, um, Council? What about its uh, uh, role? And what about the role of the regional ones? And what about public uh, debate? Uh, what will be their role in the future? So the topic I'd like to cover is the representativity of these intermediary bodies. It's often said that uh, the uh, union representation and uh, the union of CEOs uh, uh, are uh, highly representative, are uh, not very representative because of the uh, um, partial representation. What, uh, Mr. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and for the to this discussion. Uh, first of all, as you were saying, uh, 
I, and by I, I mean my organization, Force Ouvrière, we, we, we have a different view of what a union is and the role of a union uh, as seen, for example, by the CFDT. I don't uh, feel we belong to an intermediary body because I don't think we are a social body that uh, have a role uh, of arbitration uh, because we know what the right solution is. I feel that I represent part of the population, our members uh, vote for a list that we present, a list of delegates in the companies in particular, and I uh, carry their demand uh, and requests in terms of uh, salary or working conditions. Uh, and uh, their demands based on the choices uh, that are made in terms of uh, political and environmental uh, laws, for example. There is an impact on uh, uh, economic activity. There's uh, the nature of jobs. And I make sure we find the right compromise solution with our, uh, the people we talk to, i.e. representative of companies or uh, the public authorities when you cover topics that are uh, that belong to the uh, uh, political sphere and i represent the members of our syndicate of our union are we sufficiently representative or not enough i uh, would say that the issue of being representative is uh, uh, really uh, uh, questioned for social partners, in particular trade uh, unions. Uh, recently, we were told that uh, we, our rate of representativity was reduced as compared to what it was in the past. Uh, can be 40, 50, 70. But if we look at what the rate of participation in political elections is concerned, it's not that bad. Uh, and uh, there are elements that take uh, 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 that have an impact there. I'll come back to that. But what I note in your question is that our representativeness is uh, challenged. Uh, but you don't uh, question uh, the representation uh, of uh, other organizations or associations or. You, we are challenged uh, only within unions, and now we are uh, considered and challenged as being the reason for the uh, lack of uh, uh, participation of citizens in political life, or and uh, sometimes we're even taxed for uh, being uh, uh, the reason for the uh, lack of participation in uh, the legislative elections. So let me come back to what we represent. An organization such as Force Ouvrière, I gave these figures at our last Congress. We represent 350,000 individual members. And this is the lowest figure because our system is highly decentralized and we have a number of members that we don't, that escape really the formal count. I note that uh, some political parties were very happy to uh, see that they had had 120,000 people voting on their platform for their primary elections. When I talk about 350,000 members, they are paying members, they take part in the meetings of the union. And I might add to these 350,000 uh, members the fact that we are in 20,000 locations in this country. Let me finish with one point, because this really enrages me. I just held the Federation's Congress for a week, and there were over 3,000 delegates. And they don't represent themselves. They represent uh, three, four, five syndicates or unions that for a whole week in Rouen, in a beautiful exhibit place, 
we were there and there was not one single report in the main uh, news. Uh, so the lack of representativity, I send back this question uh, to those uh, who do not inform us. Thank you, Mr. Martin. We've noted that there's quite a lot of uh, uh, really of a division of uh, unions and fragmentation. Uh, why do you think that the political uh, power does not uh, uh, trust uh, these uh, uh, representations uh, uh, now in France? Well, if we look at the union representations, uh, it may be considered as fragmented, but I would say that uh, uh, the, 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 the political uh, representation is fractured. We have members of uh, MEDEF. It is a spontaneous act. It's an individual one. No one forces a company and its manager to be members and to register with us. We represent companies, and that this represents company empl companies employing nine and a half million wage earners, i.e., half the private sector in France. And if we look at the figures of Geoffroy Roux de Bézieux, you have 15 uh, new federations uh, that are members of MEDEF. So when we're told that uh, we're not uh, representative, it's uh, factually wrong. Now, the real issue, and I would like uh, to, I will uh, repeat uh, the uh, words of Yves Verrier. I agree with him. In the collective uh, mind, there's this idea that social partners are old uh, organizations that only represent themselves. Uh, it's not true. The uh, social dialogue in this country is as dynamic as it ever was in history. You can measure it through the number of agreements that are signed in companies, in branches, in lines of activities, or the latest professional agreements signed at national level on topics uh, that uh, correspond to the expectations of the uh, workers. Because the real issue is, are we efficient or not? I feel to say that uh, the fact that people are abstaining in the vote is not so much linked to, to the mode of voting, but by, uh, to the fact that people feel that uh, the political sphere is not efficient enough. And there's quite a lot of agreements that have been signed uh, on uh, health at work, uh, work from home, uh, vocational training. We're not talking about uh, uh, ethereal uh, issues. We're talking about practical issues. And uh, if in the companies uh, that are members of MEDEF, some are, are, are uh, have very few members, a very few head, uh, small headcount, others have a big one. So we have seen uh, the limits of uh, all these exercises. I'm uh, uh, in favor, and MEDEF is in favor of a discussion that would be as rich as possible uh, and uh, between uh, people who are actually responsible and uh, committed and empowered. Thank you. I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Hoffman. Uh, he's in Berlin, and I would like to ask him something. What about the representativity of uh, trade unions in Germany? Do you note uh, fragmentation, which is as important as uh, the one in France? And uh, in what way does the negative uh, negotiation, collective negotiation system uh, more efficient than in France. Mr. Hoffman. Uh, very much for inviting me, and it's a pity that I can't, uh, I couldn't join you to come to Aix-en-Provence uh, to meet you in person, but I'm glad uh, that via video I can attend the session. So if it comes to uh, trade union representativity in Germany, 
the situation certainly is uh, slightly different than in France. Uh, one of the major differences is that uh, in Germany we have since uh, 1949 a unified uh, trade union organization that is the umbrella organization the dgb the uh, the german uh, trade union uh, organization as an umbrella organization of eight affiliates uh, affiliates from the metal sector from the chemical sector the public sector and so on and so forth that means the dgb as such i'm quite glad have only eight members but my eight affiliates representing in germany six million workers in all different sectors the truth is that membership also in germany since decades unfortunately is under decline we came up from 12 million members after reunification and uh, as i said nowadays uh, we have uh, we are representing six million uh, uh, individual uh, members. But representativity is not only a question of membership, and I can see here some similarities uh, in comparison to France. I will mention uh, two major aspects. Um, we just have finished in May the election for the German Works Councils. That is comparable with the Comité d'entreprise in uh, France. Every four years, uh, the members of the Works Councils in 24,000 companies uh, are elected. Uh, they are electing 180,000 uh, individual uh, workers' uh, representative, uh, representatives, so Works Councillors. And the interesting thing is uh, that the participation rate in those elections is extremely high, between 70 and 80 percent. This is a much higher percentage than in many political uh, elections we have, especially at the local level. And another important aspect for us as trade unions uh, organized under the umbrella of the DGB is that up to 80, 85 percent of the elected works councillors are belonging to a DGB trade union. So this is certainly another element which is crucial if we talk about representativeness. But nevertheless, uh, the strength of uh, trade unions um, is depending uh, certainly on membership and we have significant changes in the labor markets uh, so that our problem as DGB unions is, are we able to address trade union policies also to uh, the new type of workforce in the world, uh, in the labor world, uh, which is changing rapidly. We have also uh, experienced that uh, workers can have uh, entirely different views, different interests, and how we are able to cover source by varieties of uh, different interests, which is a big challenge. Uh, the interest for younger people, uh, the interest of people in the um, uh, in, in new sectors, uh, in startups. Or do we uh, rightly represent the interests of women into the labor market? Um, so we have learned some lessons uh, over the last decades. And I would say trade unions in Germany are still representative. Uh, there are strong uh, intermediate uh, organization and they are crucial together with employer organization in organizing uh, the labor market in Germany. And uh, if I talk about the representativeness of trade unions, I've also to reflect the representativeness of um, employer organizations because as a trade unionist, uh, it looks uh, probably a little bit strange if I say that we need strong employer organizations because only with strong employer organizations we are capable to organize the labor markets to have decent working conditions, uh, decent working times and so on and so forth. This could be an aspect for another debate because this has also changed over the last decades and we have just experienced under the circumstances of COVID-19 
uh, how we have adapted uh, to new technologies, especially to mobile work and other things, uh, where uh, social partners are challenged every day to address their policies to a changing labor market on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, uh, guaranteeing uh, good and decent jobs uh, for all or for most of uh, the people in Germany and in Europe. Merci, Perhaps, merci um, this was enough for, for the three minutes yes. I have. <laughs> merci beaucoup, Monsieur Hoffman. Alors, Madame Bédag. Mrs. Bédag. What do you uh, think of the representativity of uh, intermediary bodies? Well, when I came to this conference, I had uh, the idea. We didn't agree earlier about what it uh, represented. Uh, uh, I had the idea that intermediary bodies were a must for the uh, democracy. As you know, democracy is not something that is immovable in history because intermediary bodies obviously create resistance to the central power. It's useful. It's also something that is anchored in reality. It's also something that helps you learn in daily life what democracy is all about. In a union like yours, you're elected, people vote, etc. in the same formative. So my idea is that intermediary bodies are a must if you for the health of democracy. At Next City, our uh, unions represented. Our, our unions represented. I looked at uh, the uh, uh, participation in the elections. Uh, usually, it's 40 percent, 30 percent, and in some, it's 50 percent. And uh, for the presidential elections, uh, we only had 50 percent. So there is a lack of interest in uh, elections in general. And when I sit in the uh, Works Council of Next City, I ask myself not about uh, the representativity in, in terms of figures, but I feel my question is what they're telling me. Does that represent the reality in the company? There are things I haven't seen. I'm a manager who actually likes to be in the teams and uh, to see what's working and not working, but I'm not always told what doesn't work. And uh, uh, when you're convinced about something, uh, you can wonder whether they help you uh, organize the strategy of the company. And the, the answer is clearly yes. We saw it during COVID crisis. We had a crisis uh, group every week with all the union representatives. and. Uh, we had a great result. I didn't lose anyone on the way. Uh, people don't always dare tell you that they're not doing well or things are not well. And uh, this communication with the unions was absolutely essential for us. If I forget figures, if I told uh, I feel that uh, the unions are really representing the life of the company. The only uh, issue we have because I have uh, union members that have been in the company for a long time. They know it well, and they're present everywhere in the territory. But the problem is, who is going to take over? When I see uh, old union members uh, retire, I regret them, because they know the company well. They're uh, really committed to the growth of the company, and they have trouble getting new people to join because they feel, OK, is it useful if I'm a member of a union? Uh, will I be set aside? And uh, my uh, worry is more about who's going to take over. Uh, do the youngsters consider these intermediary bodies as useful? I feel they're useful and necessary, but do they want to commit into them? That's a real issue for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Second point I'd like to cover in more details is about social dialogue. We started covering the topic, where does the social dialogue stand? I would like to remind you of something that is important, it seems. Last uh, April 14, there was a national agreement uh, uh, that was signed on parity. And in this agreement, it is asked for the uh, uh, continuous social dialogue leading to a par paritary uh, economic and social dialogue uh, led by the social partners. But we do have a feeling that over the last few years, the state uh, uh, tr 
tried uh, to uh, challenge uh, the union representations uh, uh, by taking over the uh, management of uh, these uh, 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 organizations. So this has uh, uh, led to inflationary uh, tensions that might modify uh, the social dialogue in our country. We can talk about uh, the strike in the railway company this week. So, uh, at Next City, Mrs. Bedag, can you tell us about uh, how the discussions uh, take place? Uh, have uh, the unions uh, uh, played a role in these discussions? And what about uh, the issue of uh, salary increases in view of the uh, uh, inflation we have now? Have you started the discussion? We have uh, to remember that uh, last December, we were uh, told that we would have a rising inflation, uh, that over the first quarter there would be inflation, and then the river would return to its bed thanks to the proper uh, uh, exchange of goods. That was uh, where we were in, uh, in December. But we, in December, saw right away the increase in the energy bills. And we said we have to support people and help them because this is going to be a real issue. And we added uh, 100 euros to the premium that was given by Macron, by Mr. Macron. So we added uh, then 200 uh, euros in February. And uh, in uh, our employee participation agreements, uh, we, as we had uh, quite uh, a good year last year, there was about uh, at least 500 euros for everyone. But uh, our uh, teams uh, uh, were able to get the same savings as the previous years, i.e. 40% of the people get the cash right away, others save it. And uh, now we're going to distribute free shares. So we have a rhythm that uh, really was welcome at the time. I believe we can all say that uh, the inflation we were uh, thinking we would get uh, in December is not uh, what we're getting. It's not the same. It won't last the same. It's going to be to to be even worse in 23, and uh, even in 2022 we might uh, come back to more reasonable figures. But the prices will have gone up. So I believe the actual inflation hasn't really started. It's going to start at the big uh, in the fall. This is a discussion we were having earlier. The uh, uh, salary negotiations are now more complicated because of uh, the uh, uh, social dialogue as it is now. Because uh, companies tend to share their added value and uh, protect develop their development. And we were uh, talking about this uh, with Eve earlier on. He, uh, he said, uh, but some people, everybody has to uh, get some uh, something from it. And I was mentioning the development of the company. And uh, he was saying, well, it's not my problem. Uh, so uh, obviously, it's important to find agreements. I find agreements on all topics. We had uh, an employee participation scheme that was negotiated last year, one on disabled people. And it's only the remote, uh, the work from home agreement that we didn't uh, sign because I've, I considered that I couldn't pay extra for uh, the people who were uh, working uh, from home than uh, to uh, someone who comes to the office. So I believe we really have a good negotiation. Everybody goes along the same way. But when you're talking about salary and wage negotiation, it gets more complicated. So uh, Patrick Martin. Uh, I turn to you now. If we look at uh, the uh, recently elected parliament that might have an impact on negotiations, would it not be a good opportunity to strengthen the role of um, collective bargaining and labor relations? Well, we'll soon find out, I guess. But what we fear is that we uh, actually uh, had good reasons to be concerned. If we look at our National Assembly, 
uh, well, there could be a lot of inertia, a lot of uh, hindrance, and that some imperative decisions that need to be made for our country and for our companies uh, may not be made, uh, regardless of what um, uh, direction uh, decision makers take. There's, well, we can look at the bright side. Uh, N not only during this last term, but even before, there's been so many legislative texts, very verbose, very detailed, uh, and sometimes not consistent. Apologies for being a bit technical, but if you look at the AGEC uh, and the uh, Climate and Resilience Laws, these two bills are contradictory. And then there are decrees for the implementation of the AGEC uh, law uh, that are still pending. So for the population, I guess that must be a, a, a bit um, uh, mind-numbing. Uh, and they might have the impression, they might be under the impression that parliament and government uh, uh, try to legislate on everything, but not necessarily on what really is needed uh, uh, um, uh, urgently. Uh, secondly, it is a fact that in terms of collective bargaining and labor relations, uh, the employee and employer representatives might have been disregarded, a bit ignored during the last term. And I think that was a mistake because it's a time bomb, you know, uh, our, our country. There's a lot of discontent in our country. We tend to decentralize decision making and, uh, and consultation. I think it's a mistake on the part of uh, the government to want to uh, rule everything in a very top-down manner. That was a, a really bad mistake <coughs> to uh, ban the accumulation of two um, elective mandates uh, because it means that uh, political decision makers uh, are no longer rooted in a local uh, area, no longer in touch. Um, if we look at that landscape, uh, I think uh, employee and employer representatives really want to uh, prove that they can be full-fledged partners in the co-construction of solutions and they can contribute to a number of situations that might be stalemates, uh, might be uh, solved or unlocked if the government can rely on an agreement between employer representatives and employer representatives that might make it easier for a government to pass laws. That's not to say that we're going to uh, obey the government. It's not to say that employer representatives and employee representatives will agree on everything. On um, the issue of um, pensions and retiring age, uh, we uh, We'll continue to uh, assume our responsibilities, as we've always done. Mr. Verrier, let me turn to you. Um, what is the room for maneuver of trade unions in France? And do you think that this, uh, that joint decision making uh, really works in France? Well, a room for maneuver in terms of collective bargaining does not really rely on the assessment of trade unions. Uh, I'll uh, respond to what you said. I'm not saying it's not uh, um, uh, our, our business to uh, respond to the situation. Um, you mentioned uh, works councils. What uh, caused me to, prompted me to object in this shared uh, councils, shared uh, 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 bodies. Uh, I'm not here to explain why the expectations of uh, uh, employees might be excessive uh, um, because of the situation. Uh, poverty is rising. Number of employees who consider themselves to be uh, in poverty has risen. And we're not talking about statistics here. We're talking about people, men and women and their children who find it hard to find housing, to make ends meet. Um, so if people come to me and say, uh, well, uh, because of the economic context, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an, I'm, I'm no economist, but 
uh, it still remains true that the situation of employees faced with the surge in uh, petrol prices, inflation, uh, but amongst employees, there's, there's a lot of inequalities as well. That is one of the challenges we have to rise up to. We have to represent people who are in very diverse situations. And I'm thinking of the role of the government. It'd be a good thing if political decision makers assumed their responsibilities, took their responsibilities, which is to uh, really be in the driver's seat uh, to um, define uh, uh, economic policies, they actually uh, have bailed out from this. They haven't taken that responsibility, which might explain low turnout at elections. Uh, and faced with uh, climate change as well, uh, it seems that political decision makers are, are actually overwhelmed. Uh, and so now uh, political decision decision makers uh, want to tackle the uh, impact of economic uh, situation by uh, 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 appropriating redistribution uh, of uh, uh, income and uh, social uh, equality. So we find it very difficult in SMEs and small companies. Uh, you. Uh, the, they are in, in difficult situations. You mentioned yellow vest movements. They uh, are uh, often uh, uh, on part-time jobs. Uh, and of course, if you are a single mom, uh, it's not going to be easy for you to uh, go to the um, trade union meeting. Um, and then when people come to us, they uh, uh, usually are in a, in a real fix. So we find it very difficult to organize a, a, a trade uh, a representation for these employees. So we're very, uh, it's a far cry from um, the good old days when uh, in the industry, uh, uh, trade unions uh, uh, managed to rally a lot of people uh, uh, around employee representations. You mentioned that in trade unions, so uh, in the 90,000 uh, you mentioned, there's the unilateral, unilateral decisions of employers. Well, there are 60,000 uh, collective bargaining agreements that are negotiated every year. That's uh, not negligible. Uh, if we look at it as an economic mass, this is a lot more than what Yellow Vest Movement uh, obtained. Uh, and so uh, they're, they're, it's born fruit. Uh, and, uh, for example, what we've negotiated on the uh, level of contribution, the level of social contributions for employees and for uh, also uh, re uh, pensioners, uh, that represents 70 to 80 billion worth of social contributions. Um, unemployment benefits, that's not something that gov the government uh, 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 can be free to uh, make cuts uh, on just to, 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 to make savings. So if uh, the idea of having joint employee-employer representative uh, uh, meetings or uh, um, uh, bodies uh, uh, is viewed as a way to diffuse the situation, uh, I think that's too simplistic. Uh, and, you know, there was this whole uh, bonus uh, uh, and penalty uh, system to try to make it impossible for uh, uh, companies to multiply short-term contracts or fixed-term contracts. Uh, quite recently, uh, uh, well, uh, I became uh, the Secretary General of Force Ouvrière, uh, so one uh, um, of uh, the French uh, uh, trade unions. If uh, if we could explain today that, uh, uh, you know, uh, back in the 50s, when uh, it was trade unions that secured pension, uh, 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 pensions and unemployment benefits, people um, joined trade unions in very large numbers. So maybe this is what we would need today to rally a lot of people around in uh, trade unions. Uh, and. Uh, uh, there's going to be uh, uh, an, uh, um, uh, negotiations opened on um, uh, lost time injuries and uh, 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 incidents in the workplace. Uh, 
so that uh, it be, and we're trying to obtain that um, compensations in cases of uh, lost time injuries be uh, put directly uh, in the uh, in a fund, and and uh, so that uh, uh, it's not taken away from uh, employees. The, the government is trying to make cuts to try and make savings uh, uh, because uh, they uh, have uh, uh, debts and uh, unsustainable uh, uh, f uh, funds. And there's a lack of training, education, information on what trade unions do, what, uh, what their added value is. So it is a challenge we need to rise up to. But minimum wage, uh, we consider that uh, minimum wage does not uh, rise enough, bearing in mind in, uh, the inflation. Well, if it has uh, um, uh, been raised to its uh, current level, it's, th it's, a, it, it, it's a victory that um, we owe to trade unions. But everybody's forgotten about that. So we think it's automatic. And uh, we no longer consider that it is something we've uh, won and had to uh, fight tooth and nails for. I'll uh, turn to Mr. Hoffman. Thank you for your patience, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask you, could you explain how does collective bargaining take place in Germany? How does it work? And would you say that industrial relations are easier in Germany compared to France? Um, so the, the first aspect is that uh, the negotiation take place mainly at the sectorial level. That means in the metal sector, the chemical sector, or the public service sector, and so on and so forth. So, um, and what is important, and Jean-Yves mentioned it, that in our agreements, uh, we are covering much more than uh, the salary. Uh, working conditions, uh, working time, further training, uh, a number of qualitative elements have become over the last years more and more important, especially training, further training qualification to uh, keep the employability of the workforce uh, high uh, in order to get uh, decent wages and de decent jobs. The problem is, in Germany, that we have been facing also over the last decades a decline in the coverage of collective agreements. Uh, in the 90s, we had a coverage of uh, approximately 70, 75% of workers who are covered by a collective agreement uh, reached by employers and trade unions at the sectoral level. Uh, after reunification, uh, this decline in the coverage has accelerated, and nowadays, and this is the biggest challenge for us in Germany, nowadays the coverage is uh, approximately 50%. Only every second employee is gaining from collective agreements. And this has a number of reasons. Uh, one of the key reasons is that uh, many companies don't join any longer an employer organization, so that they are not covered by an agreement. And even worse, a number of employer organizations give the opportunity to companies to join an employer organization, but not that they will be belonging to collective agreements. So this is um, one of the reasons why, finally, also in Germany, as it uh, uh, is the case in France since uh, a long time, we had to introduce a minimum wage uh, uh, by legislation and not by collective uh, agreements. Uh, but I say also quite clearly, in Germany, uh, minimum wage is only the second best solution, the best solution for workers, but also for companies companies, by the end of the day, are decent collective agreements. And we are discussing a number of instruments, how we will be able to increase the coverage uh, of uh, collective um, agreements. And one of the key factors is, for example, that uh, public procurement should take place only in cases if the company who is offering a certain service um, 
is um, uh, connected to a collective agreement, because if not, the consequence in Germany is that public procurement are financed by taxpayers. Uh, in cases, those companies are not uh, paying decent salaries based on collective agreements, make um, a competitive advantage, uh, but the disadvantage for the workers is that by the end of the month, they have to ask for additional social contributions in order that they will be able uh, to uh, have a, a decent uh, income. And this is be paid by the taxpayers again. And that doesn't make sense for a system what we are calling social market economy. And a final remark I would like to make in this respect, because this is important for France as well as for Germany and many other European countries. Under the French presidency, we have um, reached um, an agreement um, concerning a directive for minimum wages in Europe. The minimum wages in Europe will be different uh, based on the economic strengths, but uh, in this directive, uh, member states of the European Union are urged in case the coverage of collective bargaining is below 80%, that member states of the European Union should provide action programs how they intend to increase the coverage of collective bargaining again. And I think this is a strong instrument and uh, we have to watch this quite carefully because it's not only a problem in Germany that the coverage is approximately 50%, in many other countries it's even below. Yes. And this is uh, really uh, one of the biggest challenge for social partners if they are not responsible and if they are not able to cover a majority of the workforce with agreements to guarantee decent jobs, good working conditions, good working times, uh, holidays and so on and so forth, then it will be also a, a question uh, why we need uh, social partners if they are not able to shape the labor market in challenging times. So we have to strengthen the system and Europe can contribute to this strengthening. Uh, this is a point uh, I would like to address um, as a final remark. Thanks very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Hoffman. Thank you very much, sir. Well, we have a few minutes left to tackle the third question, so I'll ask you all to be brief and efficient. So, the third question is the role played by civil society and its impact on actual political decision making. Ms. Uh, Bidag, I'll turn to you. Uh, to what extent do you think companies can have an impact on, uh, uh, on, on, on the real world and to really make good on the, their commitments to the employees? I think companies, private companies and business, uh, uh, businesses have always had an impact, always, have always had an impact on uh, uh, people's lives. Um, regardless of where I go, we always talk about uh, my core business, which is housing. You know, housing is uh, at the heart of um, uh, people's lives, uh, cost of living, working life, health, and next city. Uh, at next city, we've always uh, thought we uh, had a role to play. Uh, I think maybe it's uh, uh, now asserted more explicitly. Maybe it was more innovative back in 20 years, uh, back 20 years ago. Uh, we want to, and, and, and our employees want to feel useful as well. They have to be rooted in reality. I think they're um, uh, losing hope because they cast their ballot and, and then they, they, it seems to them that it has no impact. So they're frustrated. They want to commit. Uh, uh, and. Uh, when we uh, provide low-carbon, affordable housing, uh, we fulfill a, um, a social role uh, and uh, we uh, also prov uh, provide uh, these uh, sort of uh, 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 
new form of housing that bring together 10 to 20 housing units uh, 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 that are really affordable. Uh, uh, we also have a foundation that is extremely close to young people, so our doors are wide open to um, secondary school interns. Uh, we have opened our doors and that has led to some really great uh, experience and we also finance apprenticeship centers um, and I think a, a private citizen want to feel useful, they want to be fully engaged they, and, and businesses should make that possible for them. I think it's also a way of uh, uh, increasing our talent retention uh, we, and it makes it easier to recruit people, uh, especially young generations that uh, really uh, need to find a sense of purpose. Uh, I hope I was efficient enough. Well, yes, indeed, we have very little time. I'll turn to you, Mr. Verrier, very briefly, please. A quick question on the Economic, Social and Environmental Council that's supposed to be the, the, the third um, uh, sort of uh, arm of parliament next to National Assembly and the Senate. Uh, does it work? Uh, you have a minute and a half. Well, that... Uh, Council should indeed uh, have a great added value, but it's not the case. So it has a very long history, so I couldn't possibly sum it up in a minute and a half. But Leon Chouot, who was the Secretary General of the CGT uh, trade union uh, at the beginning of the century until uh, the 1950s, in, back in the, in the 1920s, he was the first to come up with that idea of an economic and social council that was supposed to be um, uh, uh, counterbalancing um, a, a counterbalance uh, because workers had been sent uh, to uh, the battlefield uh, and uh, time had come for workers to be on an equal footing with comp private businesses and uh, managers and should have a say uh, on decisions being made uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of big industrial uh, uh, um, orientation. So the point was to make for a forum where uh, this conversation could take place, where there would be a public debate and consultation. Uh, so either uh, strike a compromise, uh, pass on these uh, uh, views and opinions to uh, public authorities, uh, unfortunately, after World War II, that was frowned upon, that economic and uh, social council was frowned upon by General de Gaulle. So he left it uh, standing, but he turned it into a big assembly that was viewed as uh, uh, in competition with the National Assembly and the Senate. Uh, and General de Gaulle wanted to merge the Social and Economic Council with the Senate. So we opposed that because we didn't want to become co-legislators, co-lawmakers. We wanted to um, uh, stay in our roles as uh, union shop stewards. And then what emer emerged since then is a, a whole array of think tanks and foundations that uh, look into these questions, issue reports, consult experts. So uh, turning it into a sort of foundation or a big think tank, it's lost uh, its point, its purpose. We'll have to uh, 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 come back to uh, uh, a forum uh, where social, economic, environmental questions are discussed, uh, where there can be free debate, uh, and so that it really can uh, um, uh, uh, not uh, be uh, a, 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 a uh, a rubber stamping uh, uh, entity, but a real forum uh, uh, for uh, uh, public debate. Well, uh, I'm afraid you'll have very little time, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Martin. Um, there's a multiplica multiplication of um, uh, entities, think tanks, uh, uh, citizens' uh, debates. My question is, does it not bypass the role of civil society organizations? One minute. Well, a figure. 
There's a SEDAP study that was published in January, according to which 82% of French people consider that uh, there's, uh, we that uh, uh, civil society organizations are not trusted enough and not consulted enough. The multiplication of uh, entities um, sort of takes away uh, legitimacy from the existing um, uh, uh, institutions and organizations. So, but there are expectations, there are needs to be met for a more direct form of democracy. Uh, so from the perspective of the French Business Confederation, MEDEF, I think we have to make uh, game rules really clear and make sure that everybody abides by these rules. And I'll uh, wrap up with a slightly provocative point. The Climate Convention is a counterexample in the way uh, members were selected, in the way uh, discussions were uh, run, and in the, f in the fact that there's a big blind spot, which is impact studies. The whole economic and social dimension was completely disregarded, which resulted in a, um, a legislative text that frustrated everybody. Um, uh, it frustrated uh, employee representatives as well as us as a French business confederation. So yes, such consultations are needed, but we have to be absolutely clear on the end goal and uh, the terms and conditions. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you all. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, many thanks from Berlin for taking part in this panel discussion. And enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye, Rainer. Bye, Rainer. Ciao. Bye-bye. Peace. Peace.